Cheers again, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek and just a VR history video. Uh, I wanted to just quickly talk about how long I've enjoyed VR and then kind of get into the history. Uh, you know, when did the whole concept of virtual reality start? And it's a pretty neat story with some um, crazy inventions along the way. But for me personally, it started 1980 and I remember this crystal clear. I can't even remember what grade I was in. I'd have to do the math. I believe it was grade two or grade three, grade three. And I would walk by, which I later found out was an arcade, but back then I could only describe it as these awesome electronic sounds coming from inside this building. The building was a drive-in restaurant called The Three Bears, and it was across from a high school, which was North Surrey High School at that time. And there were always teenagers in front, so I was always intimidated to go inside. One day, no teens. So I'm like, hell with it. Let's go inside. Let's check this out. I remember walking in, the noises, those awesome electronic futuristic sounds getting louder and louder. You got to remember, I was a Star Wars kid. Uh, Saturday morning cartoons, Gen X, and there it was, right kind of at the dawn of arcades. I look to my left, and I see Battle Zone. Now, Battlezone is arguably the first real virtual reality arcade game. It also happens to be the first arcade game I ever played. And I was hooked. I could basically, my current career, my interest, my hobbies, they can all be traced down to that one decision to go inside the arcade and check out where these sounds were coming from. So Battlezone was line graphics. It wasn't even filled polygons, shaded. It was basically vector-based game but it was amazing for the time and it was very immersive then you fast forward and i've talked about this in other videos uh, you know uh, virtual reality in terms of my coming across it with star wars the holodeck and next generation but that was the seed well what about the seed for virtual reality you know with regards to it as a concept as a word as a thought never mind a technology well we can go back all the way to the 1930s and there was a playwright Antonin Arnaud who described the illusory nature of theater and one of the things that he said is and he basically envisioned a theater of space that would appeal to all your senses now it's a pretty primitive description but you can see kind of that bridge to virtual reality as we understand it forming the nucleus of it was right there fast forward a few more years and a fellow by the name of Stanley Weinbaum he wrote a book called Pygmalion Spectacles and in that book there's a quote uh, on describing it and he goes a movie that gives on sight and sound taste smell and touch you are in the story you speak to the shadows and with shadows he was meaning characters and they reply to you and instead of being on a screen the story is about you and you are in it now that's pretty powerful stuff and it's basically describing virtual reality and what makes this so impressive you got to remember is yeah there was uh radio tv was developmental infancy it hadn't become mainstream yet theaters were still the order of the day both plays and movie theater right you got to go fast forward to about the 1950s and then you've got a fellow by the name of morton heilig and he wrote about an experience theater and he says one that could encompass all the senses and draw the viewer in to the on-screen activity. Now, that would be pretty cool in and of itself, but it doesn't sound too much different from the previous guy, right? No, with one small exception. He wasn't content to just talk about it, write about it. He built it. And in the 1960s, he built a prototype called Sensorama. I'm going to show you a picture here, guys, but research this thing. Look it up. I'm going to have links. It is absolutely amazing. 
purely mechanical, and yet clearly you see the influence of later arcade cabinets in that design. Uh, it almost kind of looks like Battlezone looked. It was a sit-down thing, and it offered stereoscopic film. You could view that. It had a wide field of view. And part of what made it really like took it to the next level, and you still don't have that now, uh, except California Adventure Line has one ride, but it could throw scents at you. So, uh, you know, a bit of a gasoline smell, sandy type smell. One of the, the tracks in Sensorama was a, a desert type race in automobiles, like sand dune buggies. And he included those scents. And he really built this unit to be something that could be expanded on. And it was looked at by later people in the 90s, and they were just blown away that this thing built 30 years prior could deliver such virtual reality immersion, right? There wasn't even that term really yet for it, and yet it delivered that. And you get to basically the 1970s and stereoscopic 3D. I mean, all of us Gen X kids basically had a Viewmaster, and I think they still sell it. Um, can't remember if I bought one for my kid or not. But anyways, it was like a wheel, and on the wheel you had pictures. The pictures were stereoscopic color, and the Viewmaster was also built in the 1930s. I believe it was 1939. But to this day is pretty cool because of the stereoscopic image that you can see. It's all static. It you know, wasn't animated for, th for the particular model that I'm talking about. But it was amazing just to see something in stereoscopic 3D. In the 1970s, students at MIT made what was called Aspen Interactive Movie Map. And if you look at that, I'll have the link in the YouTube video. It clearly is the inspiration uh, whether they intended it or not, for Google's Street View, right? Those Google cars that went to so many different countries in the world and filmed 360 as they were driving down the streets. Picture that just in the forward direction, and you have an idea of what these MIT students came up with. So you could navigate around Aspen. Uh, it had interactive, it was touch screen. Granted, it was on a CRT kind of television, but you basically had that Google Street View and could roam around and check out highlights that were delivered with that awesome Stephen Hawking's computer-generated really bad voice of the 70s and 80s. So that kind of gave it its, old, uh, its own charm. Now, you take that, you take the Viewmaster, we've got all these things that are elements and the sensorama of virtual reality, but the concept really hadn't been fleshed out. Now, in the 1980s uh, and even late 70s, you could argue, you start seeing the subgenre of science fiction, which is cyberpunk, right? And I could do a whole video on cyberpunk, but suffice it to say, the concepts of virtual reality were fleshed out in that medium, right? In terms of writing about it, uh, hacking, the you know intranet, internet, all of that was developed in cyberpunk. Now, it was 1985 when a company called VPL Research developed what would become Mattel's Power Glove. And anybody who had a Nintendo Entertainment System at that time had probably or has probably heard of the Power Glove, which in hindsight is extremely cheesy, but back then was a pretty cool thing. Okay, not really. Even back then we thought it was pretty cheesy, but it did show the promise of what could be right within the confines unfortunately technology wise of what was so the 1980s is where really or 1990 actually where vr took off as the vr that we know today in 1990 a group called the virtuality group created virtuality and virtuality was an arcade machine it used the it kind of looked like that Omni treadmill, the whole base of it. You put on an HMD and you used a hand controller on that type of a treadmill system. 
Now, the movement was different. It basically created the bounds of the game, but you get the point in terms of how it looked. Aesthetically, that's what it looked like. So that was in 1990. Then you had Sega VR, and Sega VR never made it past the arcade. It was basically an arcade creation. They intended to do a home consumer use model, but it never came to fruition. But the one that did, and actually before I get to that, there was a magazine called Computer Gaming World. And for older geeks like me, that and PC Gamer were, you know, the pre-internet means really other than BBSs for reading about games and new technology. And they had a quote in their 1991 issue, in one of the 1991 issues, where they said that virtual reality would become affordable, an affordable reality by 1994. So what happened in 1994? Well, we had the Sega VR that I mentioned, and we also had a company called uh, Forte, which developed the V or FX, FVX1 model. And I'm gonna put that up on the screen, but what you see almost right away is how much current HMD designs borrowed, whether intentionally or not from that unit, right? The headset, the earphone is there, the visor portion, the Cyberpuck controller, uh, kind of, you can see it looking as a, you know, a way more primitive Oculus touch, but that kind of idea, you hold it in your palm and it used an ISA card or ISA, which was pre-AGP and PCI Express and PCI even. It was kind of the standard of the, of the 80s and early 90s ISA. So it came with that card. The problem was, and even at the time, uh, VR authors talked about this, uh, Barry Sherman, for example, he wrote a book called Glimpses of Heaven, Visions of Hell, VR and Its Implications. And he looked at these devices like the Sega One and the uh, Forte FVX1 unit, and he seeded the same complaints that we hear today that have for the most part been addressed, right? Latency, low resolution, poor graphics, poor games. Now you can go uh, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable, not applicable to a point. You could still argue 4K would be so much better and it would, but at least it's practical now. Back then you had VGA, 320 by 200, 256 color, just wasn't very immersive. The resolution, 320 by 200, like I said, not very immersive. Horrible latency. Uh, poor bus and bandwidth speeds. That all contributed to just a nauseatingly poor visual experience but the promise was there and it's kind of sad that it reached this this fever pitch kind of in 1995 and maybe had it been a better game maybe had they managed to pull off vr just a little bit better even at super vga it could have become something but instead we reached this fever pitch and then it just disappears like it was literally sucked into a black hole and gone now I've looked back at this device and the game that it was most, you know, kind of lauded with was System Shock from then Looking Glass Technologies. Just an amazing game. I always loved the enhanced version of System Shock, the CD game, because I could play it in Super VGA with really cheesy bad voiceovers for the crew tapes that you would discover on the various decks. And I've seen video now of that game played with that Forte FVX1 unit. And yes, all those complaints are valid, but still, it would have been so cool to try that. And I was recently in touch with somebody who still has the unit uh, with System Shock. Um, so, I mean, it's something, it's definitely on my list if I could come across a unit fairly cheap uh, that I would go to the lengths of building an older ISA system and actually trying it. I'd love to try it. And then you have the gap, basically, to now. And I don't need to go over what kind of brought VR back, but it's been with us, you know, through most of the 20th century and then just went silent for two decades. But thankfully, it came back at the right time, the right place, with most of those factors addressed. And all we really have to do now is just kind of look forward to the cool stuff that will come. The reality of what, you know, teenage me saw with the Holodeck deck 
m melded with the technology to deliver on that. And we are probably going to get something pretty damn cool. I would bet within the next 10 years that will absolutely blow our current experiences out of the water. And we'll look back and we will chuckle. And I can't wait. That will be awesome. All right, guys, as always, cheers.